Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the Wheeler Centre Fifth Estate tonight. My name is Sally Warhaft, and uh, it's a pleasure to have Les Hinton with us, and uh, all the way from the US. Uh, Les worked for Rupert Murdoch for over 50 years, which uh, for a couple of weeks I've just been trying to contemplate working for anyone for 50 years. Especially Rupert Murdoch. Especially <laughs> Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> Uh, he started as a, a copy boy in Adelaide and then a cadet, a journalist, a bit of foreign correspondence in there, an executive and a lieutenant. He oversaw the business of mastheads including The Times, The News of the World and The Wall Street Journal. He resigned in 2011. Please welcome the former CEO of Dow Jones and Company and now the author of a memoir, published by Scribe, The Bootle Boy, Les Hinton. Um, I thought, Les, we'll start tonight really highbrow. We'll see where we end up. Uh, and uh, it's going to be the first poetry reading ever at the Fifth Estate. Uh, it's from The New Yorker, which, of course, is not a uh, Murdoch publication, uh, a poem written by a bloke called Ben Greeman. It's titled, Every Follicle Diabolical. Go on. <laughs> Les Hinton's hair will not behave. It grows and flows a silver wave. Les Hinton's hair will not comply with orders that come from on high. Les Hinton's hair has its own mind. It only acts when it's inclined. It's shiny, ruthless, debonair. It's everything, Les Hinton's hair. <laughs> uh, that poem was published in The New Yorker in response to uh, the sexist attention paid to Rebecca Brooks's hair, uh, which uh, the, the flaming uh, red hair, but also them imagining the News Corp phone hacking scandal as a musical. Yes, yes. It wasn't as much fun as most musicals, I have to say. You, uh, you probably often over 50 years have kicked yourself with, you know, how did my life come to that, but I reckon having a, a New Yorker poem about your hair, it pro does it get any better than that? I, I tell you, that, that, that period when that poem appeared was the, one of the bleakest of my career, the bleakest of my career, and so a lot of miserable friends, and we would have dinner parties, and, and my wife, Kath, would uh, make everyone pay attention, she'd tap a glass, and then she'd read it out loud and make everyone sing it, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that kind of light, lightened the moment a, a little, yes. I, uh, I mean, Rupert Murdoch, of course, is accustomed to getting what he wants. Not everything that he wants, uh, but I reckon he'd give up a newspaper or two for your hair. Well, he would, yes. And probably for a few years, few of my years as well. <laughs> as <they. laughs> uh, we'll start with the, you know, really, it's an, it's an obvious question, but what, what is he like? And, and what do you think we misunderstand the most about him? Well, I don't think everybody misunderstands him, but he is probably a significantly misunderstood mogul. Uh, but a lot of the bad things that are said about him, about him being tough, being cantankerous, being ruthless, uh, really, really relentless in competition, that's all true. Uh, he is like that, and he's built a business like that. And, and his, um, his best friend in life, I think, is his business. And his greatest loyalty in life, I think, is to his business. Uh, so that has created a man of massive, relentless determination. And he's taken that determination from continent to continent and become a kind of authentic colossus in, in doing it. But that's the kind of person that created the company. But those who work closely to him, and I work very closely with him, there is, a, there is another side to Rupert which he doesn't actually display. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a quite a lot of kindness to him. Uh, and he, he cares quite a lot about old hands who've worked for us. I mean, for instance, I would, um, every now and then, I might make a decision about a particular editor or an executive that wasn't working out, and you have to make these tough decisions. And I would tell him that I was going to let X go, and he would listen and say, OK. And then he'd say, well, what are you doing for him? Uh, how much are you paying him or her? Uh, and I'd say, ah, oh, you know, he said, 
she or he worked really hard for us for a long, long time. You know, do a bit better, do a bit better. He said that to me all the time. And when I arrived in one job, it was in London, actually, I was going through the books, the diligent news, zealous executive, looking at all the expenses and seeing where things were wasted. And I saw these list of people getting sort of thousands of pounds a month for consultancy. And I, since I'd never heard of any of them, I said to the finance guys, can we kind of clean up the consultants a bit? And they all said, well, you better speak to Mr. Murdoch. And I did, and he said, look, so-and-so, so-and-so, and so So they all worked for me for years. They went through a hell with me. They did warping with me. They did loads of stuff. He said, you know, I was tough on them. And you never know, they might come in handy, so keep paying them. He was really looking after them. I mean, I didn't really need them, but he was looking after them, and that was the kind of thing he would do, which is something that people don't, and I don't think he particularly likes people knowing that he does things like that, because I think he quite enjoys this idea of the, of the uppity sort of kid, as he used to be, who traveled the world and was arriving everywhere, underestimated, and would confound everyone with his, with his hard work and his tactics. He loved to be that. He loved to be the serial immigrant arriving in a new place. You say in the book, actually, that he, you, you suspect he might miss that. I do. I, I, I think I, I, it struck me when I was moved to London. We'd, I'd been with him a long time. There was another big job, but there was a problem in our London office. And he took me to dinner. And he talked about, oh, he said, you know, these people are going to be, they're going to be really you know, kissing up to you and look, be careful, don't accept knighthoods when they offer them. And, and he said, you know, when I came here, they really underestimated me. And then he talked about being underestimated. And he talked about, in a way, being, being the, 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 the kid with nothing to lose and with a, a sort of a, a boundless self-belief. Uh, and, and I think really that is what, he was addicted to crisis, but I think he loved that sense of being somewhere and being underestimated. You can't start another news, uh, you can't start another network in television, you can't make the sun successful, you can't, you, there are, you can't start sky television. And of course he did all these things and he loved that. But he got to the point where of course he was no longer underestimated by anybody. He was the absolute, you know, he was the 20 ton gorilla. I've been... I think that changed him. I think, I think it, it, it sort of drowned, that, all that success kind of drowned a little of the original man, I think. I've been thinking of people that are alive that I could, you know, realistically compare him to, the sort of some of the experiences at least of his life. And the only person that kept coming to mind was actually Queen Elizabeth. Uh, for, for lots wow. of, for, well, I know, it was, but for lots of reasons. I mean, their longevity, of course, as incredibly uh, powerful people. But uh, two particular things. The, the first is that uh, the family, the family company, and this idea that high up people in these uh, institutions are almost part of the family, almost, um, and a sense that the people that work for them will do almost anything as an extension of that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think, so far as the Queen is concerned, uh, there wasn't much competition for her job. I mean, she, 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 <laughs> she, she didn't face quite the same intensity and exhausting kind of competition. The, the, there's a similarity you could make between uh, the monarchy and Rupert is that his um, lifelong wish for his children to inherit his business, uh, while he's in fact probably a devoted Republican. There was a, there's probably a little bit of a contradiction in that. Yes. Uh, but uh, but I, I, I think people did. I say in the book uh, that it never occurred to me when I worked there, but it's possible that... Um, in a way, his company was like a personality cult because there was such devotion to him and, and he was so ever-present and people who worked for him um, really did almost, not everyone, but a lot of people sort of wondered at his power and his success. Uh, and the, there was that sense of him being uh, all-powerful. And I think in a way it's like, a, he was always in his head, I think, a small businessman. Even when it became big, he loved to be really close to things. So he, he got people like me to run big chunks of the business, but he loved to get down into the nitty-gritty about a particular problem or a, or a particular idea. Well, you say that one of the difficulties working for him is that he actually knew and knows more about the business than anyone else, right down to in incredible little details like disliking certain fonts. I know. Well, And I was talking in particular about... His working for him in his newspapers, because although he understood uh, m movies and television, he didn't really have that. I mean, he, organically, in his he, organically, he's a newspaper man and he's interested in news. But he can equally argue, and I could never understand what they were talking about. He would argue with some 
pressman about the speed of a press, the, the ratio of the output, uh, the, 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 whether he could use a folder to turn it into a, a, a tabloid from a broadsheet, all these things he knew about. And you'd see him arrive in a new newspaper, like the most recent one I was with him when we occupied, so to speak, uh, was, the, was the Wall Street Journal, the production people there that were used to speaking to all the executives, all the suits, uh, and just being believed with, ev with everything they said about the technicalities of a pro producing a paper. He could argue with them on every single point. And that, because he loved it, he grew up with it. Another really telling one was that he, he always said, make the newspaper, never make the layout too tidy. Always make it look a bit urgent, yeah. you know, like it's just been yeah, put together yeah, to come yeah. out. And, I mean, I thought that was, it's probably an old newspaper trick, but I hadn't heard it before. And I, I thought, you know, that that's somebody that, is thinking deeply about perceptions yeah, all yeah. the time. Yeah, I think, I think I, that was his view. I think it may have been, by now, maybe outdated because newspapers have become very much more graphic as they've had to compete with all kinds of other visual, uh, sensual, sensory kind of sensory uh, media. But yeah, he would, he would, he believed that what gave a page of a newspaper its, its dynamism and its urgency was the fact that it looked a little hastily done. You met him for the first time when you were 15 or 16. You were a 15. cadet uh, in Adelaide. Yes. And he simply said, can you get me a ham sandwich, please? Well, actually, my first encounter, that, that was the first time we actually exchanged Spoke. words. Mm. The first time I encountered him was uh, when I was about 15 years and six months old, doing what copy boys, I, was, I wasn't a cadet then, uh, did with the only television set in the entire building of the Adelaide News, this little Adelaide newspaper, which is the only thing he owned at that point, was in his office. And television, of course, then was a fascinating thing. And what we would do on quiet nights, uh, and I did often, would be to go down to his office, hide behind the studio and switch on the telly. And I was doing it one night, watching Bonanza or Wagon Train or something or other. Uh, and um, suddenly the light goes on <laughs> and in walks Rupert. And I'm sitting behind, fortunately for me, I'm sitting behind the sofa and I just sat there like thinking, oh, this is <laughs> All my dreams are about to be shattered. And he was there in the office for about 90 seconds. It felt like about a century uh, and turned off the television. And I told him years later about this close shave that I'd had with him, which he thought was incredibly humorous, but he also didn't dispute that he would have fired me on the spot if he found me. So. The, the encounter that he was aware of having with you, uh, with the ham sandwich, do you remember how you actually felt? Was there already a sense of presence? I mean, you talk about, you know, when you used to tell executives that he was going to be coming to New York yeah, or London, yeah, that yeah. a shiver would go down their spines. And was there already a sense of that when you met him as a boy? To, to some extent there was, because he was only 28. Uh, but he was the very ever-present, dashing, as in hurrying, uh, owner of the place. And so he was the boss and he was the owner. So within the context of this little universe, he was very big. But um, so when he asked me to buy him a sandwich, came up to me, had a cigarette, used to smoke in those days, and chubby cheeks, hard to believe, had a cigarette, and he asked me to put, took out a 10 shilling note and asked me to buy him a ham sandwich. Uh, at least I thought he had, because I was so uh, uh, overwhelmed by having to say, use the words for the first time in my life, yes, Mr. Murdoch. I went out to buy the, uh, to buy the sandwich and I'd forgotten what he wanted, so I bought a ham and a, ham and a beef and, and said, w did you order a, a ham or a beef sandwich? And he said, ham, and I, so I pulled the ham out and gave it to him. He loves that story because he tells it all the time. But, uh, you didn't speak to him again for another 15 years. Not meaningfully. I mean, I, 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 I bought him all kinds of sandwiches, hamburgers, <laughs> cigarettes. Uh, and I said, yes, Mr. Murdoch, a thousand times. But I didn't actually have a, a, engage with him for about 15 years. But you used these small encounters in a kind of Murdoch-esque way in, in that when you got to London uh, and this bloke called Rupert Murdoch had arrived from Australia and nobody had ever heard of him, you really egged the fact that you knew him. <clears throat> I did. But, I, but it's, what's interesting, actually, well, when I was... Just one small story, if you don't mind. Well, when I was there as a, as a lowly copy boy, one of my jobs was fixing the newspaper files in the editor's office, a great man called Rowan Rivette. And one morning, Rivette came into my office, into his office, my office, his office, and, and said, this is a day you will remember for the rest of your life. It is the day that Rupert Murdoch 
left Adelaide to begin building a great newspaper empire. And he just bought a now defunct newspaper called the Daily Mirror in Sydney. And I don't think either Rivette, who told me, or Rupert at the time, could have imagined that that news in, a, in the Adelaide news was going to become the name for this extraordinary uh, operation to, uh, 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 around the world. But that was, that was the moment, and I remember that moment really well. Also, incidentally, uh, about two months after that exchange I had with Rowan Rivette, he became the very first editor that Rupert Murdoch ever fired. I don't have the fingers to count them all, mm. but he was the first. What, what's the narrative that you imbibe when you work for Murdoch that everybody gets? I, I, um, that's a good question, and it's even better if I could give you a, a good answer. But I, but I think the thing, the thing he did, what he didn't do, or the, what narrative he didn't deliver, he didn't actually have visions. He didn't really, even when he gave me huge jobs, sit me down and tell me how to do them. What, what he did was he was an inc uh, incredibly hard worker, and in all my life working with him closely, he never revealed to me any great secrets of his, of his success. He was smart, but there are loads of smart people. But he worked incredibly hard, and he had a, a huge courage. And I think he, by being the way he was, he and he could be a tyrant, and he could be cantankerous, he could be very, very difficult to work with, but he always imbued us with this huge sense of possibility because we'd seen him do things. We'd seen him take on, make a success of the Daily Mirror. We'd seen him go to London. We'd seen him go to New York. We'd seen him go to Los Angeles. So he had this record, and that, if there was a narrative, that was a sort of, like an example, there's a beacon sounds too grand, but, he, but he, it was the way he worked and how hard he worked. Uh, and he never, ever, ever, and I know lots of people who've become very senior who do, he, there's no one ever worked harder than him. No one ever got into the office earlier than him. So there was that, that was the narrative. Look at me, uh, do as I, uh, as I do, although he never uttered it in that way. You knew in order to keep up with him, you had to be able to keep up with him and you had to be able to stand up to him when you disagreed with him because the, the greatest, you know, you look at the list of ex-executives uh, 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 that, that, that exists. I've, there's a list of people that used to work there. It's like it's like reading a war memorial. You know, it was it was fantastic attrition mm. uh, because you because they were a obsequious or b not very efficient. But you had to be able to stand up to him. Uh, you had to have courage to do that and to work as hard as he did. That is the closest I can come to a narrative. I think my sense from the book is that I mean, you know, you when you do stand up to him, sometimes often actually you're able to persuade him and often you're not, uh, is, is there a, a, you know, one particular thing that stands out to you where you didn't persuade him and, you know, to your dying day you'll, you'll think you he was... You regret. Now, I can think of those occasions where I, 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 I won because they were so much fewer <laughs> so than much the others. So much more pleasant. <laughs> uh, but, 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 no, I mean, he... Um, that there was, that there were, uh, there was. I mean, I, I made decisions. I, I would have closed magazines occasionally that I thought we should give more of a shot to, and he made the decision. Don't throw his great line when we started a new business that wasn't working was, don't throw good money after bad. That was what he would always say, mm. and he made sometimes he'd say, no enough, and and sometimes I think if we'd hung on, but by and large, those decisions were from the gut, and he was usually he was usually right. There are several really riveting. Uh, parts of the book, uh, the phone hacking, which we'll we'll get to. Uh, oh, thank you. Is <laughs> it's it, it really is it 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 reads like a story where you you know you don't know the end. <laughs> it's so tense and yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, awful to relive it. Um, but the other one, another one for me was the 1990 recession, uh, and I, I'd forgotten, you know, how close Murdoch got to the whole thing collapsing. Mm. The share prices mm. uh, plunged. He owed money to 140 banks and had to basically persuade every single one of those banks mm. to just give him, a, mm. give, him a, give him a bit of wriggle room. Uh, and you describe it as a life or, or death mission. Mm. I just wonder what you think might have happened 
if it had all gone under, what global media would look like? I mean, it's nearly 30 years ago now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you, you, can, you can imagine what would have happened, but, but the, 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 the issue was that the company was quite big and you know, it was owed a lot of debt and the debt was being called in and had we had to pay the debt, then it would have required to the, basically the liquidation of the company. So all the assets would have been dismembered and sold off to various people. As it was, some had to be sold, but not many were. Uh, and I... Um, I think it's possible Rupert would have rebounded and, and come back and done something else because he was only relatively young then. He was, I think, around about in his early 50s. Uh, and he had massive energy. So he wouldn't have, I don't think he would have retreated. Uh, but that would have been a huge uh, setback for him to, to, to have had to, to, have to re retreat like that. And when we did it, I mean, we had to sit in front of it. It was a bigger crowd than this by far like uh, steep banks. It was like standing in the Colosseum trying to convince these 140 bankers that we were good with their money, uh, which we managed to do. But it was, it was everyone, it's more recent, but also it was more dramatic. Everyone thinks of the phone hacking scandal as being a threat to him, but really this was the existential threat uh, to his entire empire, and it came very close uh, to, to, to folding. Did it change him? Uh, well, the, the, the most important difference that it made to the way the business was run is that previously he didn't like having shareholders that he had to be beholden to. So the company was controlled by him and run with debt. And, and when that went wrong and this debt suddenly rebelled on him, as it were, he then be, he floated the company and made it a much more uh, widely owned company and, and therefore had to while he never lost control because of the way the voting's constructed, he did have to answer to a lot more shareholders than he had to before. So I think, in a way, it, 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 it essentially broadened the ownership of the company in a way that made a difference. But it didn't stop him uh, acting very boldly in the years that followed. Um, your own life in journalism, uh, I mean, it, you know, you read the early stories and... Uh, you know, smoking newsrooms and typewriters. Mm. Um, you learned shorthand and everything about production, all the detail, of course, mm. that he also, uh, you know, it was a tremendous interest to him. What do you think in journalism, in media, is the biggest loss from the culture of those days compared to now? The days when newspapers were the most powerful form of news, the most influential form of news, when newspapers were in most households, when only one-third of homes, say in the 50s, or fewer than that in this country, had television sets, the newspapers were, were, were mightily powerful. So the big, the big change that's happened is that that power is evaporating quite rapidly. And so that's, that's the, big, the big difference. The, 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 the power that news, which is why I love the idea of working for them, was that they really did drive conversation. They really were powerful. <coughs> Excuse me. Do, do you think there's been a loss, though, in the... I mean, one of the things he's loved to do is to make things shorter, snappier, less time for journalists to really uh, yeah. investigate and so on. That, 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 that's been a... I mean, that's a trend that's, that's universal. Uh, but, but what... See, what, what basically happened there was that the newspapers were the, 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 the media which a lot of people here will remember media was basically a pyramid and and at the very top of the pyramid there were the few there were the big state broadcasters the big commercial broadcasters and the newspapers and they basically were the funnel for everything that everybody got to know went down to this wide base and they, they were the consumers at the bottom waiting basically to a large extent getting what they were given. They, there was choice, obviously, but, but there were, to, to a large extent, the decisions about what you saw and read were being made by quite few people. Now, uh, that pyramid is basically upside down because one person with an iPhone or whatever, Samsung, has got infinity in the palm of their hands. They can access infinite information. Uh, and, and that's the change that has created everything. It's wrecking the economic model of newspapers. It's challenging conventional television. It's changed everything. Uh, and in the end, I don't think it's a, it's a troubling thing in the sense that it's so, it's so completely disruptive and that the fact that newspapers are having to really rapidly rethink how they distribute their their journalism, but in a way, it is it is a great 
it is a great, that's the, that's the biggest change, sort of atomized media, mm. atomized choice, infinite possibilities. But you have to work out how to select it. You have to work out the fake from the bad, the, 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 the wrong and the malign from the, from the decent. Those are more difficult things to do. But I think in the end, uh, it's a better world because of it. Um, I'm going to read a quote from your book, which is a, a description of a party at Elizabeth Murdoch and Matthew oh, Freud's yes. house in uh, 2011. We represented that night the component parts of British life at the top. Rival politicians, competing company bosses, warring television moguls, enemy editors. It was a summit meeting, a high gathering of the new establishment. We were all happy participants in this tournament of egos. Um, a, a fascinating and deeply disturbing quote, uh, I think, for anybody that reads it that isn't on the in uh, mm -hmm. and should probably be disturbing for those that are. Yeah. Uh, what don't we want to know about that kind of summit? What don't we want mm. to know? I, well, the, the most... Uh, let me, I can't think of any secrets to tell you. I mean, the fact... What was, the reason I wrote that... It was at the beginning of the part of the book about the uh, incredibly explosive phone hacking thing. And the fact is that this, this comfy little world was blown apart by what happened in the following few, uh, few days, in fact. But that kind of gathering, that kind of, that kind of shoulder rubbing of people that appreciate that, that, that tournament of egos, I was quite pleased with that phrase, that, 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 that tournament of egos is, is not a new thing. Uh, and if anything, uh, you go back to the establishment in this country 100 years ago, or Britain or America, uh, the, the, the power that people like that held and the access to that uh, group uh, was much more difficult and much more exclusive than it is now. I mean, I was a—I grew up in a bombed-out sort of suburb of of, uh, of Bootle, one of the most hard-pressed areas of Britain during the war. Very, my my, my parents had didn't even have electricity when I was born. Uh, th th that was uh, so I got there. I mean, so I think I think it's a much more open world. But the fact is that that power likes power. They mix with each other, they massage each other. But I said later that this caravan is permanent but ever-changing. People come and people go, but the caravan moves on, leaving behind its casualties. So it's an abstract thing in a way. Do you think that the people that are in it are honestly able to reflect on the unseemliness of it? What, having a good, good party? <laughs> <laughs> of, you know, politicians and... Uh, people so high up in the media being that intertwined. Yes. So you see, that, 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 that's a, a great point. And it, it is, in all the thinking about how power works uh, and how it's used and how it can corrupt, that association of very powerful people, whether they're very rich people who are sponsoring politicians, which they do, or whether they are um, uh, newspaper people who can um, either give approval or disapproval to politicians. So, so there is that dynamic going on. Uh, and the, if you took a look at all three of them, the, the, the businessmen want the press to treat them well, they want the politicians to treat them well, uh, the, the politicians want to please the businessmen and they want to please the journalists. That is uh, an undeniable fact uh, and you can't since they do interact and they do have to judge each other uh, and that newspapers are supposed to take a view about the way in which politicians are conducting themselves then getting to know them and having them get to know you is unavoidable and in fact done properly not wrong you can't not know these people you can't not listen to them just as we want to see them being interviewed on TV, we, you've, got to be a, uh, you've got to be associated with them. But if you become too close uh, and uh, um, that becomes unhealthy, obviously. I mean, I have to say that I left after 52 years in which I'd you know, met presidents and prime ministers, spent time with them, uh, but I always knew that it wasn't real. I always knew they didn't really care at all about me. It was only what I represented for them. And when I left the job, rather abruptly, uh, has to be said, but I didn't miss that at all because it was always artificial. You have to be close, and I would say this to editors all the time, you, you've got to know what's going on, but do not be sucked into their world because they are not your friends. But it's, everyone doesn't succeed in that. Mm -hmm. uh, you left that party, as it happens, with Rebecca Brooks, 
yes. and her husband by yes. coincidence. Uh, and the next day there's a report in the news of the world about the hacking of the voicemail of the murdered schoolgirl, uh, Millie Dowles, and everything began uh, unravelling. Mm. What, what part of it do you... I mean, you resigned and your resignation was accepted. Mm. Um, did it surprise you, by the way, that he accepted your resignation? He didn't accept it the first time I no. offered it. But he, but he... Look, it was inevitable. When the news of the world was... I wouldn't want really to get ahead of people who aren't familiar with it, but when the, the News of the World, which is a 168-year-old newspaper, was closed because of what had happened in phone hacking, it became clear to me then that, that um, I'd been there. I mean, I didn't know what was going on, but it happened on my watch, and the consequences were so grave, uh, and the casualties were so numerous. Hundreds of people lost their job by that decision. I thought it was right for me to go, uh, and I, I regretted it. I was sorry about it. I was grief-stricken about it, uh, but uh, I, it was it was something that had to happen. I think. But uh, the way you describe it is a um, that it's a, I guess symbolic in a sense that you 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 say you know you weren't responsible for the secret payoffs to victims of that that, that the company had made. You weren't responsible for the. Um, management of affairs as they flew out of control. Well, I wasn't in that there when story. That happened, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, so was your resignation. Is that just symbolism? Is it that somebody has to go? It had to be somebody really high up, uh, and that it kind of had to be you. Or is there some part of it that you say, no, I, I take responsibility for being. At the you know very near to the top of the helm of a culture yeah. that had gotten out of control. Well, the, the, the culture getting out of control we need to put in perspective. I mean, there was clearly, and the trouble with talking about this is that it is very important to recognise up front nothing can forgive or understate the significance of what happened. Eight people were found guilty, and several of them went to prison uh, on the news of the world. But this was a company, News, News International, which I ran. It included the Times Literary Supplement, Times of London, Sunday Times, uh, magazines, um, radio stations. There was a lot, a huge company, six or 7,000 people. 300 of them worked on the, on the News of the World, and a small number of them were doing this. So the culture being out of control is rather broadly stating it than, than is wanted. It's true that the newspaper at its top was out of control. Uh, and that is what happened. Uh, and it, it transpired as well that other newspapers not owned by the company were doing exactly the same thing. But, it, but we were at the forefront. We had the, the um, uh, disability of an owner that had built up over the years of working with heavy boots and tough tactics, put up lots of enemies. Uh, so there was, but it was wrong. Uh, it was, uh, to a degree that I hope I've explained, out of control. And, and I was there when it was happening. Now, you know, since they were breaking the law, obviously they didn't tell me. But it still was something that was there. People know generally if they work for a company. If you work in a department store, you know you're not supposed to shoplift. Uh, and and if, you, if you work as a journalist, you know you're not, you're not supposed to break the law. And these people did. What was it like? Tell us a bit about that feeling of suddenly being the prey, as you describe it, of, of the press pack. The, it, because this is kind of when I was able to sit back and be a little more detached about it. I thought, well, I've spent my entire life in media, and and both as a reporter and as an editor and as a, as an executive, and I've seen, as a consequence of that, loads of people have huge media storms visited on them, whether it was Princess Diana or whoever it was, and suddenly I found myself, and I arrived at Rupert's apartment in New York the day I was going to quit, that I did quit, and suddenly found myself besieged by photographers, and I thought, this is, like, weird. I've been on this, that side of this fence mm. so long, and now, and it's really horrible experience. Mm. It's mm. a horrible experience. Mm. Uh, I've, I've been on the receiving end of yes. <clears throat> a publisher telling me to get lost, and uh, the newspapers being weirdly fascinated in a small, very small way, obviously, compared to what you went through. But mm. it was just awful. Um, and I wondered, you know, if it changed your mind or your sense of 
the things that you just taken for granted in the newspapers that you and and in other forms of media too over the years, where every single day innocent people in Murdoch publications are um, hurt, are hurt by stories that they have no part in. Uh, they're put. I mean, in, right now in Melbourne, the Herald Sun is 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 printing relentless stories about Sudanese youth. And you stop and think about all the Sudanese youth who are um, great citizens being incredible, their lives being changed on a day-to-day -day basis mm. um, in an awful, awful way, mm. uh, being made open to being uh, attacked, uh, all for just the daily fodder of a newspaper. So if, if you're saying to me that that the Herald Sun, and I, I won't compete with you on your knowledge of what the Herald Sun's doing, I only arrived here last night, if you're saying that their that their stories are deliberately inciting people to be violent towards Somali immigrants, well, I'm that's not saying that. I'm not saying that they're they're inciting people. I'm to not be, I'm no, saying if you yeah, are saying no, that, it's wrong. No, I mean, I, but clearly, clearly the way I'm saying which, the effect of it yeah. is to cause incredible disturbance and and, and is to um, is to not take responsibility for cultivating racism. Right. That's how I would put well, it. Well, I, well, well. All I can tell you is that, it, that, that if I was involved with a newspaper, which I was involved with many, and I thought that they were actually cultivating racial and racial hatred, I would stop it happening. But I, I can't speak for the Herald Sun because I don't know it or what it's done. Well, I, I would say it's so probably I, fairly typical, you know, tabloid fair mm. um, around the, the, the Murdoch Empire. I don't think there'd be... I think it's... Uh, and, and I know they would, of course, defend it and, you know attempt to demolish my my version of it. But the, the broader point is that there are victims of so many stories every day that go into newspapers. When you became the prey, when you mm. felt that gaze, did it change the way you reflected on the work that you've done in your life at well, all? Well, I, 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 su I suppose it brought me into, into, into a different form of excuse me, contact with it. But, but I do think that newspapers have the job of saying what they think and listening to their readers. I think that's important. Uh, and I think sometimes when, the, when, a, when a newspaper takes a strong position, some of its readers agree. I'm not addressing what you're talking about because I don't no, know no, that's, about it. Yeah. That, 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 that some people agree and some people disagree. If they champion a particular politician... Uh, then obviously there are going to be people who think it's wrong and they'll read all kinds of unfairness and unreasonableness into that kind of thing. But I think that, that a, jo a newspaper's job is to be passionate, it is to be opinionated, but it isn't to be cruel. Uh, and, and newspapers can be cruel. Newspapers can be very uh, inconsiderate. They can be wicked sometimes. And um, I don't think there are newspapers I would, I would um, describe as wicked newspapers, but things go wrong in the way newspapers cover things. And you, you, had, you referred to the Murdoch press in a way that some, perhaps suggests that you might think that the Murdoch press is more guilty of this kind of uh, going over the edge than, than other newspapers. I would dispute that. I mean, and I, just recently, looking at all the newspapers Rupert owns, there was a survey done by the Reuters Institute at Oxford University, which was a, a look at trust in the media and it looked at all, at all the newspapers in, the, in Britain and all the newspapers in uh, the United States, and it found the most trusted one in America was the Wall Street Journal, mm. Rupert Murdoch owned, and the Times of London. Now, you know, that, that's, uh, it doesn't wash away what you consider to be wrongdoing, but it isn't, I mean, it, it is not a newspaper that, that seeks to be, uh, I'm sorry, a company that seeks to be malign in what it does. Um, the readership, though, I mean, those wonderful uh, newspapers that you, you, you talk about, are, they're, they're, they're writing, they're, they're for the summit, aren't they? Uh, the mass newspapers. Um, okay, let me put it a, a different way and, uh, and I'm going to uh, flash in front of you a note that um, uh, when you, after you resigned and Rupert kept ringing you uh, yes. in the days following you <clears throat> and you write that you're you were on the phone with him one day and you were looking very pale and your wife flashed a note up remember you don't work for him anymore <laughs> <laughs> 
That, that's, that, that brought my blood pressure down on about 20 occasions after I left, actually. <laughs> so with that in mind, um, do you think that, that the publications, the Murdoch publications, can be too combative? No. Why? Because I don't think that you can be too combative. You, 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 what you talked about before specifically, uh, and the, what you described specifically, when again, I'm only listening to your description, that's not combative, that's wrong. That, that is wrong. So, so, so for, to do that is wrong. But to be combative newspapers, and this is an interesting thing about the power of the press and the power of big newspapers to hold people to account. You know, the, the dissipation of big newspaper groups means that that power of the press is kind of, um, as I said before, atomizing. And the ability of a, like when you think of things, let's say, the, the Washington Post standing up to Richard Nixon, uh, a little website wouldn't have had a prayer if it got the Pentagon Papers. Uh, but, but newspapers, because they're powerful, because they're profitable, because they've got political supporters, all those, all those machinations of what hold a society together are what newspapers represent. That is beginning to diminish. And you can find pluses in that, uh, the power of newspapers owned, in your view, by Rupert to be cruel and racist is going to diminish, but there'll be a great de deal of... Um, Racism in social media, of course, but it won't be concentrated in that way. But I think that's a, that's a, you have to think about whether that's going to give, leave power, make power less accountable to people that, that they've got to reckon with. It's still massively powerful, though, or Rupert Murdoch wouldn't be in it anymore uh, if owning these mastheads uh, didn't give him enormous power. I, you didn't... I, you see, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt no. you, because I, I think concluding that Rupert has spent his life in newspapers for the power of them, um, I don't know, what, what was this power for? Well, tell me. But no, but, I, but, I, but, it, but, if, you're, but if, you're a, if you're a journalist and you're an editor, you're interested and integrated in what's going on in the world, whether it's your community or your country. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. There were people, politicians do it, uh, lots of people do it, activists do it. So to have a vested interest in your company's well-being and your country's well-being uh, and your citizens' well-being is a, is a fine thing to do because it makes people like the newspaper, buy the paper, and you profit from that. There's, that's business. There's nothing wrong with that. And I don't think that owning a newspaper, I mean, they're businesses. And you, don't, you own, you, you, although Rupert's run... Newspapers that have lost money, of course. There's, there's, there's not a, I, don't see a, I don't see a contradiction in that. Um, in places, though, and there are cities, numerous cities in Australia, where, uh, you know, it's a, it's a one uh, press town where you only have the option of buying um, a newspaper that's a, a Murdoch publication. I think that... Um, uh, that is very, very influential. And I mean, are, are you saying that that power, that influence doesn't matter to me? No, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. Mm. I'm saying that you, you seem to be attaching some malign intent to it, and I don't agree with that. And the fact of, is that if you go across America for many, many years, big cities of America had only one or maybe two newspapers, and a lot of them in America for a long time were owned by a single company called Gannett. And other owned the Tribune Company. We, Rupert owned very few of those papers. So, so I certainly didn't say malign in no, 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 combativeness. But, but, no, no. Okay, uh, well, combativeness. Uh, yeah. Malign competitiveness. <laughs> well, it's sometimes. No, no, sometimes. Yeah, no, but, I, it's a, but it's a, I, but it's a matter I, yeah. of opinion. Yeah. It's a matter of opinion. And if a newspaper antagonises its readers sufficiently, and I've worked with newspapers that have made big mistakes, if a newspaper loses contact sufficiently with its readers, then its readers stop reading. Uh, and, and so the, the, a lot of what newspapers do, and sometimes they get it wrong, I, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with that, is to connect with their readership. A newspaper is only successful if it is identifying with the concerns of its readers. And if it does that, it succeeds. No newspaper is going to work unless it does. It's, it, it's fascinating that because uh, newspapers and editors, and you will remember the times when it was like this, where editors decided what was important and their job was to convince the reader. And now mm. it, I think it really is the way you're saying it, you know, that newspapers give readers what they want, what no, they demand. it's a combination, demand. it's a combination. See, the thing is, I, I, see, I, we've got a different view on this because a newspaper doesn't say 
we know what's best for the country, and even though the country doesn't agree, we're going to go on and tell them that they're wrong. I mean, that can happen, and a newspaper, but a newspaper's got to, uh, among other things, it's got to understand and articulate its readers' concerns. And if it, if it knows its readers are worried about employment, local employment, then it's got to address that issue and what's wrong with it and champion what can be done to improve that problem. Or, and it's the controversial issue you're addressing, immigration as well. I mean, there are lots of people with lots of concerns about things like this all over the world. And, and a newspaper doesn't work unless it is embedded in its community, whether it's a national or a metropolitan or, or a local community. Um, news Limited approach, the, the approach to management, um, how much has that changed, would you say, over the, the 50 years that you were there? Because it, it seems from the outside that it's still very old school, very vertical, uh, male-dominated, uh, a slightly fear-based culture of losing your job. Um, it, it's certainly not agile. You know, we hear about now agile workplaces and some pretty big institutions mm. that mm. are really changing the way their, their mm. work structure is. Do you think that um, news will need to change? See, I, I haven't worked there for seven years, you know, so, so I, I, there's been a lot of change going on there, I know, I know from hearsay. But of course it's changed with the times, and I dare say there are times when it hasn't changed very well with the times. Uh, when it bought MySpace, uh, which was a very promising music website, going back ten years ago, uh, its management of it failed. Uh, and Facebook became a triumph. Uh, so so it's, it's made mistakes, whether that's agility, whether it's a lack of, of, uh, of uh, maybe because it's too, 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 too powered by one man. But, see, but that, that, maybe there's an element of that, but, but it's also true that for a lot of the period, being powered by that one person with a vision uh, resulted in lots of things. You think of beyond newspapers, what, what media has done, if you look at, uh, look at Britain, say, and, and consider... Rupert's contribution to it there. Uh, he challenged the duopoly of state television and broadcasting and a couple of little commercial broadcasters, created Sky TV, nearly lost the company. That was what we were talking about, the debt crisis. Mm. Nearly lost the company in doing so. But by prevailing the way he did, created massive amounts of choice for, for, for British consumers. And he did that himself with his vision and his determination. In the case of the newspapers, uh, in 1985, they were totally controlled by really aggressive, I mean, thug-like unions, and no one argues with that. I'm not, I, I was a member of a union myself, but, but they were really bad the way they were behaving. They were blackmailing the company and all kinds of companies, and no newspapers had the courage to challenge them because they had so much control. He challenged them, he shattered them. All his rivals who sat back uh, it was said that the, 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 the carnivore liberated the herbivores. Uh, they all ended up being able to, being able to, to uh, do all the technology that had been resisted by these unions. That gave massive additional length uh, of life and depth to British newspapers. Now, he did that himself. So those two things alone, I could go to America, go on about that, but because there were things he did wrong as well. But, but this notion that he's somehow a tyrannical despotic, uh, power maniac is is kind of like it's kind of like a hallucination. It's like a crowdsourced apparition that all the people that think that something things are wrong with the world, they think somehow Rupert is like the he's the virtual devil, the embodiment of it. And that is for all his faults that I'm quite I think you'll agree quite honest about my view of his misgivings. That isn't what he is. I mean, he he has built a huge company, and I think uh, frankly that whatever the view of him is in this room or in many of these people in this country, I think that, that he's someone that history and Australia will be proud of in the years to come. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's interesting. It, the, the reason why my first question tonight and probably almost everybody that interview I imagine says, tell us what he's like. Uh, because the aura that you describe that he has when he walks into a room of executives... Mm. Uh, is there's a different aura, of course, uh, for people that have never uh, had the opportunity to meet him and, uh, uh, you know, he's quite enigmatic in a way. Well, he's quite... He is, a, a, believe it or not, he is quite a shy person. He's not very easy socially. But, but when he walked... When, when I told my executives in London, and I had a big meeting every week, and these people were all far cleverer than me, MBAs and 
Oxford this and Harvard that. They're really clever people. And I would say to them, uh, Rupert's going to be in town next week. And there'd be an absolutely physical reaction in the room. Mm -hmm. They'd still, they'd shuffle, they'd whisper, they'd murmur. And it was a mixture of... Uh, exhilaration and terror, mm, I think, mm. but they, but they, but they, but they actually somehow liked that. I mean, I never. He made me tense. I've said this a few times, but he, he made me tense. But I was never ever afraid of him because I always knew that if I said, "Look," when I would have an argument with him, I said, "Look, uh, 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 my job is unless you ask me to do something illegal, to do what you want or quit." I said, "And I will do what you want in this, but you have got to listen to me because it's my job to make sure that you're." wholly equipped with my point of view before you make this decision. And you, if you could deal with him like that. And he, of course, he, he couldn't run a company this big for this long with this much success without having been able to bring around him really good people because he couldn't do it all by himself, and he didn't. Do you miss him? Do you miss that sort of intensity of... No. Nah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it was, it was, it was tough, but... I, 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 but he was my boss. I mean, you know, you talk, everyone talks about me being his friend. I was, but he, he didn't have friends in that sense. But he, he, was, um, he was my boss. I mean, and that, mm. that was the relationship we had. We had a very good social relationship. We spent time together. I enjoyed his company. I still see him. Uh, but I'm, I'm not unhappy not to be working for him anymore. Mm. 52 years was quite <laughs> enough, yes. <laughs> um, if you would like to ask Les Hinden a question, please... Put your arm, um, uh, yes, and if the microphone lands in it, start talking. Great. First question. Um, Ex-journo, Herald Sun. Welcome. Um, hello. <laughs> I'm sorry it's the first question, but it's a really important issue to me. I was part, um, I actually um, wrote a very extensive letter to Tracy Spicer about Me Too, the Me Too campaign, based on my work experience at the Herald Sun. So what I'd like to know is how are women currently being protected in the Murdoch universe? And also, one of my jobs um, was to write captions for the Page 3 Bikini Girl. And um, that whole salaciousness, feeding the readers what they wanted, apparently girls in small bikinis, um, to sexualise women. And um, there were consequences to that. Could you tell me what's happening in the current how long How long ago did you work there? Uh, 30 years. No, how long ago did you leave? Not, not 30 years. Yeah, yeah, 30 you, years ago. I you left, left 30 oh. years ago. Correct. Oh, wow, okay. So it was the, was it the Sun and Pictorial and the Herald then? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I haven't been there for seven years. I can't compete with you on that. Uh, I mean, the, the, the attitude towards women, there were certainly a lot more women get, getting into more senior places. There was editors. Rebecca, infamous as she, she's become, is still, the, still runs the entire um, British operation. Uh, women were in charge of the HarperCollins publishing empire. So in terms of, of women doing well, I, I wouldn't say there was the right equity between men and women by any means, but there were, there were more and more women there. I ran a magazine division of, of 20 magazines and each had an editor and publisher, I think, of all those. And this is going back a while now. Only, only of those 20, only about four or five of them were actually men because that was the point in New York where it was when women were properly... Uh, advancing, they were coming out of school. They, 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 the attitude had changed. This is going back a while now, but, but, and so we, it wasn't a decision of hiring women. We hired, we hired the best people, and they, and they were, as it happened, women. So far as the Me Too thing is concerned, uh, I, I can't really address that because I don't, I don't know what's been going on. I mean, there's been massive controversy over Fox News and Roger Ailes, which, by all accounts, was a pretty well, by all accounts, it was a pretty, isn't the right word, it was a dreadful, uh, dreadful episode, and it led to other people leaving as well. Also, it has to be said, very senior people in numerous other media companies. The Me Too issue is, I think, amazing, amazingly cathartic thing that's going on. It's very painful for people, I'm sure, especially the women who are having to, to sort of come forward. But it's, a, I mean, I think beyond media and beyond the Herald, some which I can give you no expert advice on, I think we're going through a proper social earthquake with the Me Too movement, which is going to be painful for a lot of people, but can't be anything but, 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 a, but a welcome thing. Um, it's been fascinating. Thank you very much. I was just uh, wanting, uh, Les, for you to comment uh, on the fact that one of the great threats to 
Murdoch's empire would be this whole fake news campaign by Donald Trump, yet some would say that the Fox News network in America is perhaps the, a real example of fake news and, and, and how in one way it's a threat and as to whether Rupert's doing anything to influence his great friend in uh, ending this campaign. <coughs> well, I, I don't think I'd ever describe uh, the Donald as... Um, a great friend of Rupert's. They were both businessmen in New York for years and years and didn't get along at all. I think that Fox News, for reasons that I'm frankly not clear about and to the extent they do it, I'm uncomfortable with, have become incredible apostles for Trump and his, and his apologists in every cause. of What, what, we, what we've got in, in America now is an incredible division in the way media covers things. It's very hard to find an hour of decent, balanced news in America now because you've either got... The, the, well, it's late night. It's not the same all the way through the week, the day for Fox News, but late night, there's these rabid pro-Trump people going on and finding, able, able to defend him for everything he does. I think what that's created, though, on the other side, <coughs> excuse me, is a, um, a real um, backlash on, say, CNN and NS, MSNBC, who are now equally fervently critical and dubious of everything that Trump does. If I had, frankly, to decide where my own heart lied, it would be more towards the CNN side of things, because I think that Trump is a freak. But, but, uh, but I think an awful lot of people in the country feel, uh, believe in him for reasons that you, we all may find, or many of us may find, hard to fathom. But you have to acknowledge that. He is a president that did get elected. And it's, we'll see in November, when the midterm elections happen, how well his candidates do. Uh, but there is a division in the country. It's much greater than the division in media. Uh, there's a real schism, uh, and it's being, uh, if anyone's really aggravating it, it is having a president who is under siege for various possible deeds of misconduct uh, that's attacking his own administration, his own Justice Department, his own Federal Bureau, Bureau of Investigation, uh, his own cabinet ministers. There's never been anything like it, and it doesn't. If you, did, if you thought it was insane, I think you, you might have a case. See, this is the moment where I think, you know, imagine being Rupert Murdoch and being able to let everyone know, gee, I'd love to, you know, get rid of Trump. You know, imagine if he if he if he put that energy. Yes, but there. you see, but you look that I'm on the same side as you in this um, makes it difficult for me to say this. But you're saying it, your your very statement says, look, <clears throat> everyone knows Trump's a maniac. Never mind the fact that so many people voted for him, he should be out. The fact is that they they. They voted for people, people believe in him. People believe that the news is fake. People believe that he's being stitched up. People believe the establishment is, instead of him draining the swamp, the swamp's drowning him. They believe that. So you think they're all wrong, but you can't ignore them. Well, no, that's not the point I'm making. It's about the, that combativeness that I was trying to talk about earlier in, in the media. If, you know, just occasionally on things that have such incredible importance to the world, you know, they couldn't come together a bit more and... Uh, uh, what, the media? Yeah. But the media, together in what way, all agree on something? No, not all agree on something, but not have a situation where... And I think we have it to a lesser extent here in Australia, far less, but uh, where if you say A, I'm going to say B. If you say it's a right. sunny day, I'm right. going to say it's raining. Yeah. Uh, and that, that that's the combativeness I was trying to talk about earlier, um, where... Uh, you know, you, everybody can't just take a deep breath and actually yeah. realise that this is making yeah. everything worse. Of course, what you described just then, you were talking about the media, but that is exactly the way parliaments work. Yes. The job of an opposition yes. is to disagree with everything. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. but, but, but I get very, very worried. I think we all would if they all started agreeing on everything. I mean, you do, you do want them to of fight course, with each other. Of course, but it's not an either-or, is it? You know, there are some things where you don't lose your credibility by just... Uh, uh, in politics and media, you know. I, I never know which one has the greater capacity to lift a bit, but... Uh, well, I, well, I think that they both feel, you know, it's mm. a, they're, they're, they're both starting at the bottom, I think, in that, in that effort, probably. In, the, in, the, in people's minds. Yeah. yeah. One more. 
Yes, look, uh, I'm just wondering about the scenario you painted of the, the power group. Just your mic. Oh, in the scenario that you painted of the um, power-breaking people, um, of the business, the politicians and the big newspaper people all having their own role, um, and there was some accountability, I think you suggested, that's what the newspaper were doing. Uh, but what about the other scenario now where the news, the pyramid is reversed and where the news is coming from, where is that holding accountability at that top level in the future that you see? No, well, actually, that, that, that's a good question. And I, I was trying to address that earlier when I talked about the decline of the power of these big media companies, that a big media, if, 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 if a big, new, if there is a corrupt government, uh, a big newspaper can take them on, and they do in the cases that we know about, the, the New York Times, the Washington Post and others, they, they risk their existence by going up against uh, a president, for instance. Uh, that, that is something that it's possible to imagine will be less easy if the power of, if the atomizing of newspapers, if the, uh, of this pyramid turning upside down. I still think uh, that my own view is that there'll be a consolidation, that, that there'll be big broadcast, and that even though they're still almost like, like big clumsy children, uh, operations like Facebook that are like like a, like an overgrown teenager doesn't know quite how to walk or dance. That 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 that, that they are where where new power lies, and you've got to believe at some point that. And I'm making this up as I go along, but I, it seems to make more sense than I said. That that Facebook could begin a form of, of of investigative journalism and would have the might, as great newspapers still do here and everywhere, to withstand the the pressure of. Of governments, because governments, if they're not opposed, if they're not nervous, uh, if the politicians are not being really uh, having their lives to some extent made a misery, then they are going to do enough of them are going to do bad things, and it may involve being cruel to them, being unkind to them. It's the same with businessmen; uh, they are going to do bad things. It just happens. No matter what you do, it happens. And God forbid the day when we can't have a, a healthy, vigilant, aggressive sometimes disagreeable, sometimes cruel press to um, hold them to account. Uh, it's been a fascinating conversation, Les. Thank you so much for, for coming. Uh, the Boodle Boy, <clears throat> I have dog-eared almost every page of this book. It really is uh, a fascinating book, even all the stuff about Bootle. Liz. It's an adventure uh, story. It's not it a business book. It's an, an adventure, adventure story. story. I've <laughs> only touched on fragments uh, of, of what's in here, so I encourage you to read it. Readings are our bookseller tonight. Thank you, readings. Uh, and Les will be down in the corner to uh, sign uh, sign copies and your own autograph. Is it is it thrilling to just be your own person? You know, to be well, out of that. I was always my own person. So. Yes, I'm, I'm, yes, no, I apologise. Of course be, you were. To be, be out of the be, shadow. Be, of being, I, I enjoy very much being independent. The thought of, never mind the boss, but the thought of being a, a CEO with billions of dollars of uh, to care for and thousands of employees, uh, all of whom you do not know what they're doing, as I found out. Uh, I, 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 I did that for a quarter of a century and I'm happy to, to write books now. Do, does it irritate you more that I press on the, you know, the, the, the Murdoch reputation or that I didn't ask you about Bootle? I, 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 I was. I, I think probably you, you, you sense the interest of the audience quite well. <laughs> <laughs> Please thank Les Hinton. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. Thanks, Ellie. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.